Now, we're going to digress just a little bit. I plan to bring a message on the fifth chapter of the book of James today. However, we've been working diligently on the Unregistered Baptist Fellowship meeting program uh, for October the 14th and the 16th. And I've spent so much time on it. And uh, I've been dealing with a preacher who does not believe in the uh, kingdom position that I've come to take and also your pastor and also on the position on the rapture that I've come to take. And so I prepared this message, this lesson for this pastor and sent it to him. And so I really didn't have time to prepare another message. And so in t instead of uh, just hobnobbing something together, and I'd spent so much time on this message that I'm going to go ahead and bring it to you today. And this is the message that I prepared for this pastor. So I'm going to bring it today entitled, When Will Jesus Come? So let's go, go to the Lord in prayer. Father, <clears throat> we don't suggest that we could teach anybody anything except the Holy Spirit would give us an unction. We're asking in the name of the Lord Jesus that you would help us today. We pray that you would open our spiritual eyes and hearts. Now, Father, we're not going to try to cram anything down anybody's throat. If you do not open our eyes and open our spiritual eyes and hearts, then uh, we, we don't want anybody to accept anything that we would say. If the Holy Spirit does not teach us, then uh, we wouldn't want to be taught. We pray now that you would speak to our hearts, draw us very near to you, and help us above anything on this earth to be ready when our blessed Savior, the Lord Jesus, comes again. The last thing on this earth that we would ever want would not to be ready when our blessed Savior comes again. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. Amen. When will Jesus come? Now, I tell people sometimes that I was a bus kid, except they didn't have buses back when I was just uh, a teenager. But I rode the bus to Sunday school. In other words, I'd walk down to the bus stop, get on a bus, pay the fare. It dropped me off at Cleveland and Douglas Street. And I'd walk the three blocks down to the church, Wichita Baptist Tabernacle. And then sometimes the pastor would come by and he and his wife would take me to church. Every time the pastor and his wife would come by and I would get in the car. The first thing the pastor's wife would say, Mrs. Wilson would say, Jesus is coming soon. Well, that was about 70 years ago. Every time I'd see her, she'd say, Jesus is coming soon. Well, he hadn't come yet. But when you consider that he went away 2,000 years ago. 70 years is not very long, is it? So he is coming soon. And the scripture says, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. 2,000 years ago, the scripture says, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Well, how can 2,000 years pass, and yet the Scripture says the coming of the Lord draweth nigh? What does that mean, the, Lord, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh? And yet 2,000 years have come by, gone by, and he's not come yet. So when is, when is he going to come? See? 
In the book of Matthew, chapter 24 and verse 3, Scripture says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? Because he had been talking about destroy this temple. And in three days, I'm going to raise it up again. Well, he was talking about his body. See, well, they thought he was talking about the temple. Tell us, when shall these things be? Then they said, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? Now, they were not talking about the rapture. They were talking about his coming in glory to set up his kingdom. Because they didn't know anything about the rapture. They didn't know anything about the secret coming. The only thing they knew about was his public coming. His coming in glory to set up his kingdom. When every eye would see him. And of the end of the world. Now here's where the confusion comes in. The translators of the King James Version translated this word world properly except words have meaning. Now you have to remember that for the most part the translators of the King James Version were reformed in their doctrine. They were post-millennial in their doctrine. Now, instead of translating this word world age, which would have been clearer as far as the meaning is concerned, they translated the word world. So most people, when they read the word, they think of it as the end of the world. That's what most people automatically think of. Let me give you an example. Look at Matthew chapter 28, 18 to 20. Jesus said, I will be with you to the end of the world. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you even unto the end of the world. But that word world means age, even to the end of the age. See, the scripture says, study to show thyself approved unto God. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, those who teach reformed doctrine do not divide the word of truth. They do not divide the scriptures into dispensations. Now, we don't have time to get into that today. I'm sure that Pastor Greg will teach dispensational truth and teach the covenants. There are seven dispensations. Right now, we're in the age of grace. Right now, we're in the church age. So this means... The end of the world or the end of the age. What is the end of the end of the age? The 
So Jesus said, I'll be with you to the end of the age, this age. You see. So that's what we're talking about. The end of the age. Now I want you to notice verse 4. Jesus said, be not deceived. In other words, at the end of the age, there's going to be great deception. We can expect great deception. You can write this in your notes. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 4. Paul talks about another gospel. Another Jesus, another spirit. We can expect at the end of the age another gospel, another spirit, another Jesus. He says, if another, he said, another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. He said, if anyone comes unto you with another spirit, another Jesus, Another gospel. Let him be a curse. See, that's where we are right now. Notice what it says in verse 5 of Matthew chapter 24. The Lord Jesus said, there will be false Christs that will arise. In verse 11 and verse 23, he says there will be many false prophets that will arise. In verse 24, he said, there will be many false Christs and false prophets. I want to show you something. Turn with me, please, to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 13 and verse 1. Someone let me borrow their Bible for just a moment. I've got a New Testament. I need to borrow your Bible for just... Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 13 and let me borrow your Bible for a moment. I want to read you something here. You, you turn there for me. Chapter 13. Now, let me read you something here real quick. Thank you. Let me read you something here real quick. This is an amazing verse of scripture here. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. Now, he's not suggesting that we put prophet, false prophets to death today. I'm not suggesting that. But we're certainly to put them away. So, you want to take your Bible back, please. So, the point I'm making is, the scripture says that God himself allows these false prophets to rise up to test us to see if we will continue to be faithful to him. Look at all these, look at all these healers and prosperity preachers on television today 
with huge crowds and and their their auditoriums are are filled, packed, raking in incredible amounts of money. A lady, a nurse came in to see my wife the other day and, and asked her about be actually asked her about being saved. And, and she had ordered all of the books from one of these women preachers over the, over te- that's on television. And she had all of her books and there wasn't one single thing in all of those books that could, that would have told her how to be saved and go to heaven. Well, let me let me just give you one example. In my opinion, T.D. Jakes is one of the greatest preachers just for pure preaching that I've ever heard in my life. Just, just for pure preaching, the ability to preach. Do you know what he believes? Now, listen, what did Paul, the apostle, say? If any come to you with any other gospel, let him be accursed with any other gospel. Do you know what T.D. Jakes believes? He doesn't preach it on TV. But do you know what he believes? Do you know that T.D. Jakes is a Jesus-only Pentecostal? Do you know what, do you know what Jesus, a Jesus only Pentecostal believes? He believes that you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus only and speak in tongues in order to be saved and go to heaven. That's what a Jesus only Pentecostal believes. But listening to T.D. Jakes on television, you would never know that. But that's what he believes. Look at Joel Osteen. He is a prosperity preacher. He lives in a multi-million dollar home. His guest house is worth millions of dollars. He drives an automobile. He's, he's got several automobiles that's worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Those huge, those cars that are worth, who knows how much they're worth. Because prosperity preachers have to prove that, that, their, that their, uh, their message is working. They have to prove that their message is working. I was watching one of those healers on TV one day and he he had some woman that had a short leg and he sat there and says, look at this leg grow and and the leg was supposed to have grown out full length right there in front of everybody. I made a study of all this when I was in Bible college. I went to those healing meetings. You know what they'd do? They'd get them in line. Those ca- those worst cases, they'd get them in line. But then they'd get them out of line before they'd get up to the healer. I was sitting behind this man and he was holding his little boy and the little boy was cross-eyed. And I was sitting right behind him. And I was looking at the little boy and the little boy was cross-eyed and he took the little boy and got him down in line and he went through and the healer, this was Jack Coe, and he went back down and got the little boy in line and Coe prayed for the little boy and the man was standing down there afterwards and I went down there and, and uh, I talked to the man afterwards and he was standing there and he was holding his little boy and I went up there and I looked at the little boy and, and the little boy was cross-eyed. And I said to the man, I said, oh, did, 
Did the little did your little boy get healed? And oh yes, oh my little boy got healed. I said, Well, sir, he still looks the same way that he looked. I thought he was gonna kill me. Actually, I thought the man was gonna kill me. I got out of the way. I thought he was gonna hit me right there. I remember when old Roberts came to Indianapolis, and after the meeting was over, he put out a magazine. And right on the front page of the magazine was a young lady that was a member of our church. Right on the front page of the magazine. And it says that she got healed. And Brother Dam was one of our associate pastors. And I said, hey, Brother Ernie. I said, look here, one of our members got healed in Oral Roberts' meeting. I said, let's go out to their house and visit her. So he got in the car and we drove out toward Wanamaker, and we went up to the door, and, and we went into the house, and, and we said, we want to rejoice with you over, and we had the magazine, and we said, we want to rejoice with you. Well, she hadn't gotten healed. She was in the same condition as she was. Same condition. Some of you remember Lin, Lin, Lindsay Brock. He had gone blind. But he wanted to be healed so bad and he got somebody to take him down to Kentucky and he heard there was a big healer down there. And he took him down there and took him to a healer and he paid him some big money. I don't know how much he paid him, but he never got healed. I'm not saying God doesn't heal. God healed me. God healed my daughter. Bone cancer. I'm not saying God doesn't heal. But my friends, I want to tell you something. There's a lot of deception going on. I'm going to give you just a few stories real quick. When is Christ coming back? When is he coming? We don't know. Matthew 24, verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Matthew 25, 13. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. And yet back in the middle of the 19th century, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists started. You know how these cults got started? Because there was a farmer by the name of Miller. They called the Millerites. He set a date and people actually sold everything they had, put on what they called ascension robes, went out on a mountain waiting for the coming of Christ. And then he said, well, he was wrong on the date. Set another date. And out of that came these cults. And literally thousands of people have joined those cults all because of one man. And Miller was a good man. He was a godly, clean, living man all because he set dates for the coming of Christ. I remember 1950. I would walk to high school. Back in those days, they had little boxes for the newspapers. And I was standing there and I saw the headlines of the Wichita Eagle. It was owned by some Jews and they were mocking. Jesus is coming today. And I remember the, I remember the hair literally stood up on the back of my head, neck. I saw that, that headline, the headline of the newspaper. Jesus is coming today. Some idiot had predicted that Jesus was coming on that very day. And the, and the, and the, the newspaper was mocking it. Laughing, mocking. Do you remember back in 1988, 
fellow by the name of Wissonet put out a book called 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 1988. How many remember that book? Oh, my. He sold, I don't know how many thousands and thousands and thousands of those books. 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Today. I'd like to know if anybody has any idea where you could buy one of those books today. Preachers preached from the pulpit. Preached, actually preached that book from the pulpit. And yet what did Jesus say? If Jesus doesn't know when he's coming back, how would he know? How would wisdom it know? And just recently, just recently, we found out that a man by the name of Camping, who was a good man, he's won a lot of people to the Lord. He predicted that Jesus was coming back in 2011. And there were some people, uh, what, where were they, in Vietnam, Brother, Brother Greg? North Vietnam. North Vietnam. In communist North Vietnam, these people were called the Huang people. Ignorant, just ignorant Huang people. But they were Christians in communist North Vietnam. And somehow they had heard the shortwave radio of camping. And they heard his prediction that he was coming back in 2011. And they believed it. And again, they... They sold everything with the little bit that they had, and and they went out and 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 they stood on the mountain waiting for Jesus to come because camping had given a specific date. And you know what? And there were there were thousands of them. And you know what the communists did? They went out there and killed them all. They went out there and killed them all. Say so you're you're crazy. You people are crazy. They killed them. How would you like to be camping? Who was a believer? No question. Camping was a believer. Camping has won multitudes of people for Christ. He preached the gospel. But how would you like to be him and have to face those people? When he stands at the judgment seat of Christ. Many false prophets. He didn't preach a false Christ. Camping didn't preach a false gospel. But he was a false prophet. How is Christ coming? He's coming as a thief. That's why he says, watch therefore. For you know not what your hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known. Now I want you to notice that word, good man. See, all of these words are pregnant with meaning. If the good man, not the bad man, if the good man of the house had known. In what watch the thief would come. He would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. The slothful man is not watching. A lazy man does not watch. A drunkard doesn't watch. It's only the good man that's watching. Therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. When is Jesus coming? In an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. So maybe we better be careful what we're saying, who we're gossiping about, what we're watching, where we go, what we do. 
because in an hour that we think not. When is he coming? In an hour that we think not. Now, the Old Testament is our example. Now, as I have been adjusting my thoughts and study on the kingdom, I've understood that every single thing in the New Testament is based on the Old Testament. We've always taught that, that the New Testament, that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, but the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. We've always taught that. Now look at first look at first Corinthians chapter ten for just a moment. Look at look at first Corinthians chapter ten for just a moment. This this isn't new doctrine. <coughs> this isn't anything new. So I said, Well, you're teaching something new. No, no, this isn't anything new. Look at first Corinthians chapter ten. Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I would not have that ye should be ignorant. Okay. Now look at verse 5. With many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. But they believed in God. They weren't unbelievers. Look at verse 6. But now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things. And that, that as they also lusted, neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ. Well, if they, if they tempted Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents, Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all of those things happened unto them for in, in samples as they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the age are come. For where, wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. All right. Now, what is the example in the Old Testament? What is the example in the Old Testament about the coming of Christ? What about Enoch? What about Enoch? The scripture says, Enoch walked with God and God took him. Now let me ask you a question. Would God have taken him if he had not been walking with him? That's a very simple question. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 5, it says that Enoch was translated, that's the better word than we use the word rapture. The proper word is translated. It says Enoch was translated in that he pleased God. Would he have been translated if he had not pleased God? You answer the question yourself. All right, let's talk about Elijah for just a moment. Let's talk about Elijah. Eli now, it was, everybody knew that Elijah was going to be raptured. It was prophesied. Everybody knew that Elijah was going to be raptured. Go back and read the story. And Elisha said to Elijah, when you go, 
I want a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah said, if you're with me, when I go, your wish will be granted. All right, what did that entail? It entailed that Elisha, number one, would be watchful. He had to be watching. Secondly, he had to abide with Elijah. Night and day, he had to be with him. In the old days, they would call it pouring water on the hands of of the master or the prophet. In other words, he was Elijah's servant. He waited on Elijah. He had to be with him night and day. He couldn't leave his side. Now, does that make sense? So when the chariot, when the angels came with the fiery chariot, what happened? Elisha was right by Elijah's side. So what happened? The chariot, the fiery chariot came right down and it came right between them. And they reached down and took Elijah, picked him up, took him on to glory and left Elisha. Now I ask you a question. Is that a split rapture? Is it not? So did the Old Testament teach one was taken and the other was left? Is that not the example we have in the Old Testament? It is. Is that not the example the Lord Jesus taught? He said, then shall two be in the field. Matthew chapter 24 verse 40. Two shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. By the way, that shows that it's going to be night on one side of the earth and daytime on the other side of the earth, right? Because some are going to be working and some are going to be sleeping. Is that correct? All right. As in the days of Noah. As in the days of Noah. Are you? Somebody says, well, <clears throat> there were only eight saved. Yes, only eight got into the ark and their families. Are you going to tell me that the whole world were unbelievers? No, 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 of course not. Of course not. That would would be totally ignorant to believe that the whole world were atheists, that the whole world were unbelievers. That would be total ignorance. Stupidity, believe that. In fact, for the most part, the whole world believed in God. When they believed God, they worshipped Him not as God. For the most part, the world believed in God. They just didn't believe it was going to rain. They just didn't believe it was going to be a flood. Do you know most of the world today believes in God? They just don't believe that he's coming. Most of the Christian world don't believe. Did you know that most of the Christian world today do not believe in a rapture? The Reformed doctrine doesn't believe in rapture. In a rapture, but they believe in in God. They believe in Christ. They believe in the atonement, but they don't believe in the rapture. What about the virgins? Both wise and foolish in Matthew 25, 1 through 11.
All 10 of them were virgins. They were all virgins. I'm not going to go into that. That's a separate sermon. But they were all virgins. He said, our, our lamps have gone out. They had had oil. But they'd lost their power. They'd lost their power with God. At midnight, the bridegroom came. There was even a division among the disciples. I'm not suggesting they were lost. They were not lost. Now, you've got your notes, and I'm not going to go through all this. You can read it on your own, but I want you to I'd put all this down here because I want you to see how many times the Scripture says, Watch. And I went through all of this to show you how many times it says watch. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour the Lord doth come. Watch therefore, for you do not know the day nor the hour. For the Son of Man, now I want you to notice especially Mark 13, 34. For the Son of Man, this is a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not what the master of the house cometh at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning, lest coming suddenly. When is he coming? Suddenly. Suddenly. He's coming suddenly. He finds you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto you all, watch. And if you go back and look at the ten virgins, it says, and they were all asleep. Go back and examine that. Both the wise and the foolish, they were all asleep. At midnight, they were all asleep. Both. Now I want you to notice Luke verse two, Luke chapter two and verse eight. And I inserted this because I want you to see it. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. Now look at look at this. And there were in the same country shepherds, pastors, abiding in the field. The field is the world, keeping watch over their flock by night. Is that what pastors are supposed to be doing? And lo, the angel of the Lord. So when he came the first time, is this typical? So when he came the first time, what did he find? Shepherds keeping watch over their flock by night. And what did they see? They saw the glory of the Lord. When he comes again, those pastors keeping watch over their flocks, In the dark night of the age, will they too see the glory of the Lord? See the point I'm making? See, there's little, there's little things in the Bible that if you watch, you'll see them. Oh, Brother Dixon, that you're you're just seeing. Okay. Maybe I'm just seeing things. See the point I'm making? But if you let the Holy Spirit show you things, they'll jump off the Bible pages at you. See the point I'm making? All right, keep looking. Next, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Be strong. Next. Let all your things be done with charity. Next, 
Masters, give your servants that which is just and equal. We shouldn't have to have a have a uh, minimum wage law, should we? Corporate officers making millions and giving a pittance to their workers. See the point I'm making? Let all your things be done with charity. Next, brethren, you're not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. See? Next, watch you in all things. Endure afflictions. See? Next, but the end of all things, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Now look here. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without a sin offering unto salvation. That's what that means, without sin. Without a sin offering unto salvation. Unto salvation, what does that mean? Unto Salvation, and that's referring to the kingdom. Not justification. It's talking about the kingdom, see. He's coming for those who are looking for him. Are you looking for him? Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard. Hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Those that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. The dead in Christ will rise first. All believers are in Christ in that they are justified, but all, not all believers are not in Christ as far as sanctification is concerned. I dealt with that last week, last time, under the church of God, which is at Corinth to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus our Lord, both theirs and ours. Nowhere does the Bible say that the church will be raptured. Only believers that are watching, living as overcomers, will be taken. They make up the firstborn sons, Romans 8, 29, and the bride, Revelation 3, 4. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. There are two books of life. There's a book of life for the kingdom. And there's also a book of life for eternity, for the loss. So you have to remember that. All right, Brother Greg, come right ahead. Our Father, we thank you now that we've had the privilege of bringing this message today. We thank you for the kind attention of the people. Oh, my God, help us. Help us to be ready when our Lord comes again. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.